Hello, I'm Eric from Strong Medicine, and today I'll be discussing hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, more commonly known as HLH. In brief, HLH is a rare, life-threatening disease, most common in infants and young children, but which can also occur in teens and adults, which is characterized by an acute overstimulation of the immune system, leading to systemic inflammation, cytokine storm, and multi-organ failure. There are several terms that are used to describe subtypes of HLH. Though not all experts agree on the preferred terminology, these are in common use today. Primary HLH is HLH associated with genetic mutations affecting immune system function. It usually presents at younger ages, but can less commonly present in older patients as well. Some references define familial HLH as a synonym for primary HLH, while others describe familial HLH as a subtype of primary HLH, depending upon the specific genes involved. HLH is labeled secondary or acquired when instead of an associated genetic mutation, there is another predisposing condition that triggers this particular form of immune system dysregulation. This can be a malignancy, infection, autoimmune disease, or organ transplantation. Highlighting a problem with the terminology, it appears that some patients who initially appear to have secondary HOH may actually carry mild forms of mutations that have predisposed them to the disease. In addition, the term macrophage activation syndrome is used specifically when secondary HOH is associated with an autoimmune disease. Let's talk about the clinical presentation. By a huge margin, the most common presenting symptom and sign is fever, mimicking a primary infectious etiology. On exam, patients usually have splenomegaly and hepatomegaly, as well as lymph adenopathy. Confusion and a variety of other neurologic findings are also common. Depending on the severity and whether a correct diagnosis is delayed, symptoms of additional problems may develop from HOH's complications, such as dyspnea related to anemia, hemorrhage from thrombocytopenia, and a variety of manifestations from secondary infections related to neutropenia. Because the symptoms and signs of HLH are nonspecific, and it's relatively rare, it's important to recognize a pattern of classic lab findings. The most classic is an extreme elevation of ferritin. This is a key feature of the illness in young children, a population in which there are few other causes of such high ferritins. It's less of a hallmark of the illness in adults, partially because extreme elevations are less commonly seen, and partially because there are many other diagnoses that can do this at older ages. So it's less sensitive and less specific a finding as compared to what's observed in children. Other classic findings include anemia, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, elevations of AST and ALT, elevated LDH, low fibrinogen and high D-dimer, either mimicking DIC or representing concurrent DIC. And then there are two relatively unique lab tests that are rarely, if ever, ordered in the absence of a suspicion for HLH, lower absent natural killer cell activity, and an elevation of the soluble IL-2 receptor, also known as CD25. IL-2 is a cytokine involved in the regulation of T lymphocytes and NK cells. The pathogenesis of secondary HOH is not well understood, but in primary HOH, most causative genetic mutations are in genes within the cytotoxic granule activation pathway, resulting in the inability of either natural killer cells or cytotoxic T cells to downregulate their contribution to the immune response. One of the classic findings of the disease is hemophagocytosis. This refers to the pathologic ingestion and destruction of erythrocytes, lymphocytes, or other hematopoietic precursors by histiocytes or macrophages, either in bone marrow, lymph nodes, the liver, or spleen. Here's a histiocyte with an ingested granulocyte, one with multiple cells, including mature red blood cells, and sometimes you can see some truly bizarre looking structures. Importantly, despite HOH's name, hemophagocytosis is neither necessary nor sufficient for the diagnosis. As mentioned at the beginning, 
Secondary HOH is that which lacks a genetic cause and almost always has an identifiable trigger. These triggers include infections, in which the Epstein-Barr virus is particularly notorious, but it is also seen with CMV and HIV. Bacterial, fungal, and parasitic infections have all been implicated as well. Malignancies, particularly lymphoma, can trigger HOH. Sometimes the diagnosis of HOH can precede identification of the underlying malignancy. Autoimmune disease. In children, the most common autoimmune disease that is associated with HOH is systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Also, as mentioned, this situation is referred to as macrophage activation syndrome. Organ transplantation can trigger HOH, and it's also been reported as a rare side effect of CAR T cell therapy. Regarding how clinicians can make a diagnosis of HOH, there are many different proposed sets of diagnostic criteria, but the most commonly used is the histiocyte society criteria. It allows the diagnosis to be made if the patient has a molecular diagnosis consistent with HOH, in other words, if they have a mutation known to cause the disease, or if the patient meets at least five of eight clinical criteria. These include fever, splenomegaly, cytopenias affecting at least two cell lines, high ferritin, either high triglycerides and or low fibrinogen, low NK cell activity, high soluble IL-2 receptor, and hemophagocytosis present on biopsy. Genetic testing is indicated in all children who present with HOH, but it's currently uncertain as to which adults should receive testing for genetic mutations. At the very least, it should be considered in adults who have a family history and in those for whom an acquired trigger cannot be identified. When it comes to the differential diagnosis, most cases of HOH are initially mistaken for sepsis. Given some of the similarities in presentation and the fact that sepsis is far more common, this is understandable. However, at the same time, delaying the diagnosis of HOH can have disastrous consequences. Some clues that suggest the possibility of HOH rather than sepsis are a lack of identified bacterial source after several days of investigation, neutropenia without explanation, elevated LFTs in the absence of viral hepatitis, heavy alcohol use, or shock liver, splenomegaly, and in children, a very elevated ferritin. In addition to sepsis, some other diagnoses which can be confused for HOH and vice versa include thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, hemolytic uremic syndrome, severe dress, and a rare genetic condition called autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome in which patients are unable to normally regulate their numbers of lymphocytes due to an impairment in lymphocyte apoptosis. The treatment of HLH is a complicated and evolving topic. For primary HLH, the standard of care is induction therapy with the HLH-94 protocol, named after the year it was developed. It consists of dexamethasone, etoposide, cyclosporine, though the timing of it can vary a bit, and sometimes it's omitted entirely, and the addition of intrathecal methotrexate for patients with central nervous system involvement. The HOH-94 protocol should be followed by hematopoietic cell transplantation, which represents the only possibility of cure for these patients. For secondary HOH, the approach varies depending on the trigger. Almost all patients should receive steroids. In mild cases associated with infection or autoimmune disease, treatment of the underlying condition may spare the patient from more toxic therapy. However, for severe secondary HOH, depending on the trigger, options might include the HOH-94 protocol and variations on it, anakinra, which is an IL-1 receptor antagonist, IVIG, the monoclonal antibodies rituximab and alemtuzumab, and tacrolimus among other things that have been tried. The best choice for a specific patient is nuanced, based on limited data, and is best made by an expert in the treatment of HLH. And hemopoietic cell transplantation should be done for patients with refractory disease. For both primary and secondary HLH, in addition to all of these HLH-specific treatments, 
patients can require substantial supportive care, particularly for complications related to cytopenias, meaning red cell and platelet transfusions, treatment of thrombocytopenia-related hemorrhage, and treatment of neutropenia-related infections. Regarding prognosis, HLH is a severe and often acutely life-threatening diagnosis. Among patients who do not receive treatment, median survival is only one to two months, highlighting the need for rapid diagnosis. With aggressive treatment, five-year survival overall is roughly 50%. Survival is lower in patients over 50 years of age, and those with an associated malignancy, and those with neurologic involvement, while survival is better in those with secondary HOH triggered by infection or autoimmune disease. That concludes this brief introduction to hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. If you found this to be interesting and helpful, please check out the rest of this series on underappreciated diseases, and consider subscribing to Strong Medicine for more videos on medicine and medical education.